Hi, this is David Harper of Bionic Turtle with an illustration of the approaches we can take to a hypothesis test. And to do that, I'm going to use the data set that I used in yesterday's tutorial, which is I have PE ratios, that's price to earnings ratios, for a small sample of 28 New York Stock Exchange companies. So here's the sample. These are PE ratios. I've hidden the rows for most of the companies, so you've just got to believe there's 28 rows there of PE ratios. I took the average or mean of those and got 23.25 as the average PE ratio for the small sample. I say small because it's less than 30. And then I've got two measures of dispersion, second moment measures, the variance, and then the square root of the variance, which is the standard deviation. So now I'll move the spreadsheet down. I have a count here. It tells me that there are 28 companies in the sample. DF is degrees of freedom. In many cases that is the sample size minus 1. That's the case here. So we have degrees of freedom is 27. And then I select a confidence level. It's usually 95 or 99 percent. If I s select a confidence of 95%, then the significance is going to be 5% because it's 1 minus the confidence. We also call the significance the alpha so that the confidence is 1 minus the alpha. So for example, if my confidence is 99%, then my significance, my alpha, is 1%. What we can also say about the significance, which I'll show you shortly, is that it is the probability of committing a type 1 error. What is a type 1 error? That's when we reject a null hypothesis that is really true. And I'll show you what I mean. A couple of other things we want to do here are compute the critical T. And that is just like using a statistics textbook to look up the critical T value in the back. We can use the Excel function equals TI NV. It only takes two parameters. One is the probability, and what that means in our case is the significance level, 5% for us, comma, the degrees of freedom. For us, that's the sample size, minus 1. We get 2.052. I also want the standard error of the sample. That's really the standard deviation of the sampling distribution. It's the denominator. In this formula up here in yellow, the whole formula is for the t value or the random variable that is t, we want we just want the denominator, which is the which is itself a fraction. It's the sample standard deviation divided by the square root of n, n is the sample size. So if I recreated this, I am I start with an equals for the function, the sample standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size, not the degrees of freedom and I get 1.794. In yesterday's tutorial I constructed a confidence interval. It might be easier to visualize this if the distribution here to the right, there's actually two distributions but they're pretty close to each other. The T distribution in red converges on that normal in green and if our sample mean is here in the middle what we mean by the confidence interval is in our case with 95 percent confidence we think the random variable could fall within the bounds that start at the lower limit, in other words, to the left, by 2.052 standard deviations. And that interval is bound at the upper limit by going to the right, that is adding 2.052 standard deviations. And remember, the standard deviations are the standard error. So I got the lower limit by saying equals sample mean minus, minus for the lower limit, my critical t value, which again is a function of the confidence, multiplied by my standard error or my standard deviation. I get 19.6. The upper limit, almost the same formula. I take the mean, I add the critical t multiplied by the standard error. That's my confidence interval. Now let's do a hypothesis test. To do that, I need to create a null hypothesis. My null hypothesis, and I'm just following Guarte's example from the textbook for my FRM customers. Let's say my null hypothesis is 
that the population mean is 18.5. So remember, we drew a sample of 28 companies. We found their average P-E ratio to be 23.25. But we create a null hypothesis that says, well, is it possible that the whole population P-E ratio, the true P-E ratio, is 18.5? See how it's quite a bit different. Is that possible given the small sample size? Well, we have two or two and a half ways to look at this. The first is just with the confidence interval that we've, the interval that we've constructed. Here's my confidence interval. Its lower limit is 19.6, so that's over here on the left. Its upper limit is 26, over here on the right. My hypothetical value of 18.5 falls outside of that interval. See how it's less than the lower limit? It's to the left, it's outside of it. And remember that area inside the interval constitute comprises 95% of the total area into the curve. So we reject the null hypothesis that, or we reject the idea that the true PE ratio is 18.5. Okay, so I have a second way to do this with the T value. I can just compute my own T value here. And I do that by saying equals the sample mean minus my hypothetical mean, see how that gets me a difference between them, and then I divide by the standard error. I compute a T value of 2.65 and compare that to the critical T value, which was a function of my confidence and degrees of freedom. My critical, my T value is greater than my critical T, and so similarly on that basis I can reject this null hypothesis, this idea that the population P-E ratio is 18.5. And finally, maybe the best way of all to do this is to compute a P-value. And to do that, I use the Excel function T-D-I-S-T. So that just, that returns for me the student's T distribution. And I give it my X value, which in this case is my T value. I give it the degrees of freedom. My degrees of freedom is 27. And then I give it the number of tails. And it's a two-tailed test because I, I don't want to know if my true value is greater than or less than. I just want to know if it's different than, either greater or less than. And that gives me, that returns for me the p-value, which is 1.3%. What does that tell me? Well, the p-value is really equivalent to the significance, except that I don't select it. And what it's telling me is that I can reject this null hypothesis with a significance of 1.3%, or a more intuitive way to look at this is if I take 1 minus that p, I can reject this null hypothesis with 98.7% confidence. I can be 98.7% confident that my true underlying population PE ratio is different than, that's either greater than or equal, greater than or less than the 18.5 hypothetical value. So that P value is maybe the best way to do that because I don't have to select the confidence level. I let the P value tell me with, with, with what level of confidence I can reject the null. So those are the two and a half three ways to approach the hypothesis test. This is David Harper of the Bonnock Turtle. Thanks for your time.